Hello, BookTube. I have a mail haul for you here, a stack of packages that ends in a heavy box, so it would be sort of like old times. We can start with a really thin one, so thin that it may be a slim volume of poetry. Uh, this is Tuesday, so if, if it is a slim volume of poetry, it'll be a reminder uh, that I have shamefully neglected uh, Poetry Tuesday. That is a feature that I did on this channel for the oh, hundreds of you who are new since the last time I did it. It was a feature that I did on this channel where we went through works of contemporary poetry, read a poem, maybe read two poems, and talked about them. And I loved doing it, and I learned a lot about those contemporary poems, not only from examining them, sitting down and actually reading them out loud, teach you a lot about any kind of poetry, uh, but also from you. I learned a lot from the comments field where you would just go to town analyzing those poems. We really need, I really need to get back to Poetry Tuesday uh, and, and examine, that, examine that again. Do that on Tuesdays. Maybe I'll make a mental note to do that next Tuesday. Because um, I've got plenty of poetry here and there's plenty online that I could find. Uh, oh. Oh, okay. This is not. Uh, this is not. Okay, great. This is not. Uh, a slim volume of poetry. This is a slim volume, but not a slim volume of poetry. Any chance of a Steve blurb? Steve blurb would be nice. Look at this. Everybody and his brother has a blurb on this thing. Surely there's room for me. No? No? The Jewish Herald Voice, Daily Prosper, Words and Music, New York Nudge Books, but not Steve. Oh, well, well, anyway. Uh, it doesn't matter because the book is right anyway. I'm so glad to see it in paperback. This is by Eric Vuillard, translated by Mark Polizzotti. We saw this on this channel a while ago. This is the paperback of The Order of the Day. Tiny little thing. Uh, let me read you about it because uh, if I can get past all of the blurbs, uh, because it's a totally remarkable book. And now it exists in uh, uh, $15 trade paperback that will be in your bookstores if your bookstores are open. I don't know if your bookstores are open. They shouldn't be if they are. There are three states in the United States where bookstores could conceivably be open. All the rest of the country, all the other 47 states, are either at crisis level points with this pandemic or have gone long since beyond crisis level points. Hospitals can completely swamped. Hundreds of people dying every day. Bookstores obviously shouldn't be open under such circumstances. I don't know if yours are, but you can get this, you know, sent to you as long as uh, online book services are open. They shouldn't be either, <laughs> but but uh, nevertheless, uh, let's see here. Soon to be out in paperback. Uh, this pre Goncourt winning book offers a distilled and imaginative retelling of the annexation of Austria into Nazi Germany. One of history's most foreboding and pivotal moments, and a timely warning against the perils of willfully blind acquiescence. Through a host of letters, historical documents, and photographs, the author masterfully reconstructs and looks anew at the extraordinary sequence of events that opened a gateway to one of the greatest humanitarian horrors in our history. Named a Book of the Year by NPR, the Boston Globe, the Times Literary Supplement, Spectator, Foreign Policy, and the BBC, this book exhumes a well-known history of with fresh eyes, reminding us of the timeless threats to freedom extracted by self-interest, willful ignorance, and the consolidation of power in the hands of the few. And this new paperback includes an excerpt from the author's forthcoming book, The War of the Poor. Uh, and it, I praised it as well. <laughs> I, 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 it made my list as well at the end of the year, so that's great to see it, to see it in a paperback. The date, uh, sorry. Feeling a little under the weather here. The, the date uh, for the paperback release here is the end of July, July 28th. N with paperback releases, those often aren't strict. This could be in your bookstores now. It could be available online now. Uh, but at least that's when it will be there if your bookstore is open. Uh, so let's, let's see what this next one is. Also a thin thing. Ah, uh, oh, okay. All right, uh, great. This is a finished copy uh, by Catherine Lacey. I don't know if we ever saw this on this channel. This is a finished copy, a naked finished copy of Pew by Catherine Lacey. This is no dust jacket, and the uh, the uh, description is printed onto the inside front cover uh, with the author's bio printed into the inside back cover. Interesting. I would think 
that maybe that is a stylistic choice designed to make this stick out could also be a cost-cutting choice far better as a cost-cutting choice would be to print this as a paperback again with the description printed on one cover and the author printed on the other but no none of this business just just bring it this is a 26 dollars hardcover bring it out as a 15 dollars paperback and a smaller run granted you're not paying your author as much up front but you're sustaining yourself as a business in order to pay other authors down the line and in order to give customers a break uh, but uh, let's let's see here uh, I don't know if we saw this before or not in a small unnamed town in the American South a church congregation arrives for a service and finds a figure asleep on a pew the person is genderless and racially ambiguous and refuses to speak only one family takes the strange visitor and nicknamed it takes in the strange visitor and nicknames them Pew. As the town spends the week preparing for a mysterious forgiveness festival, Pew is shuttled from one household to the next. The earnest and seemingly well-meaning townspeople see conflicting identities in Pew, and many confess their fears and secrets to them. Pew is singular. Yeah, singular person. Uh, I guess it would be insensitive. Uh, who knows? Who knows the, the minefield this thing is navigating? Uh, Pew listens and observes while experiencing brief flashes of past lives and clues about their origin. Uh, but in this case, the there refers to Pew, not to the, the plural people who are confessing their stories to Pew. That confusion arises from the misuse of the pronoun, but we have to clarify it just so you know what we're talking about. Uh, as days pass, the void around Pew's presence begins to unnerve the community whose generosity erodes into menace and suspicion. I like that. That would probably happen. That's neat. Be tough to describe, though. We'll have to see. We'll read about the author and see. Uh, yet by the time Pew's story reaches a shattering and unsettling climax at the Forgiveness Festival, the secret of who they really are, they here are referring to Pew and not to the townspeople, uh, a devil or an angel or something else entirely is dwarfed by even larger truths. Okay, this is the author's third novel, uh, the author of novels Nobody is Ever Missing and The Answers, and the short story collection Certain American States. She's received a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Whiting Award, and a New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship. She's a finalist for the New York Public Library's Young Lions Fiction Award, and was named one of Granta's Best Young American Novelists. Incredible. Incredible. Impressive. Uh, Born in Mississippi, she is based in Chicago. Okay, Catherine Lacey, so Pew. Uh, the one thing you won't get, of course, with uh, with a naked hardcover like this, or with you know with anything that's happening in the COVID era, is a pub sheet. So uh, with a pub date, this is a finished copy. So I imagine this comes out in July sometime. Maybe it's out already. Uh, we'll have to see. So that's two slim things. Uh, I'm not. I wasn't intentionally going at these packages thinness. Uh, sorted, but let's see. I'm a little bit out of practice with doing mail hauls, so let's see. Let's see what this next one is. It is uh, another finished hardcover. Let's clean these up. It's, uh, nothing you want to deal with, baby? No. Uh, okay, this doesn't have a pub sheet either. This is Trixie and Katya's Guide to Modern Womanhood. Uh, by Trixie Mattel and Katya. Uh, drag superstars Trixie Mattel and Katya have long captivated fans with their stunning looks, on-screen chemistry, and signature wit. In this book, the pair channel their energy into an age, an old-school etiquette guide for ladies. In essays, <laughs> there are no essays in this book, uh, conversations on how two sections peppered with hilarious, gorgeous photos. Trixie and Katya advise readers on beauty and fashion and tackle their vital components, the vital components of a happy home, such as money, self-love, and friendship, sharing advice and personal stories in high-concept fashion. Okay. Pretty sure I'm not the, uh, the target audience for this book. Pretty sure of that. Uh, vital components of a happy home. Money, self-love, and friendship. Okay. 
Uh, okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't list any one of those three things in the top 20 components of a vital family, <laughs> a vital family home, of a happy home. I certainly wouldn't list money first, but I imagine there's a whole, uh, these, these two are the stars of RuPaul's Drag Race, right? And so I imagine there's an entire culture of uh, niche humor that I don't know anything about. That, that I mean, yeah, the, one of the parts here is the Lady's Guide to Makeup. That is not makeup. <laughs> okay, that is something else again entirely. That's uh, public performance. This is that is a stage performance. I'm not sure that 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 is the same thing. Uh, yeah, so I'm not I'm not the niche audience for this at all. I have no idea what I would do with it. I'm not sure I would even know how to read it uh, or why I got it. Maybe uh, let's let's just move on. Let's move on to to something else here. Uh, Certainly one of you out there is going to be much more of a target audience for this book than I am. So let me know if you are. If you're a big fan of RuPaul's Drag Race, you might want this book. Uh, in which case, maybe we can arrange for me to send it to you. That certainly be willing to, to try that. Uh, oh, great. Oh, fantastic. Okay. I think we saw this on this channel before. This is Rachel Cohen, Austin Years, a memoir in five novels. This is the finished copy. Fantastic. And this, the date on this is the 21st of July. Uh, uh, I don't know if I have a description here. No, I just have blurbs. Blurbs from everybody. Uh, but I can read the description from the book uh, because I strongly recommend it. Oh my, do I recommend it. In the turbulent period around the birth of her first child and the death of her father, Rachel Cohen turned to Jane Austen to make sense of her new reality. For Cohen, simultaneously grief-stricken by the death and buoyed by the birth, reading Austen became a refuge and a ballast. Through Austin's works, she reckoned with difficult questions about mourning and memorializing, living in a household, attending to the world, reading, writing, and imagining. Austin Years is a deeply felt and sensitive examination of Cohen's relationship to Austin and to her own family. Winding together memoir and criticism, biographical and historical material about Austin herself, and like the sequence of Austin's novels, the scope of Austin Years widens successively, with each chapter following one of Austin's books. Uh, I've read this a couple of times now. I'll be reviewing this, and I uh, cannot recommend it strongly enough. Uh, and not just uh, as a perfect example of what we have all known books to do, not necessarily Jane Austen. We have all gone to books for comfort at some point or other, and we are diehard readers, so we know something that non-readers don't know, which is that somehow or other, these pressed ma materials of printed pages and ink work when you go to them for that, depending on the book and depending on the moment. I have had work, books work that way when nothing else would. Uh, in positive times and negative times, in distracted times and worried times, and I bet a lot of you have as well. And you've probably also read a lot of books from authors who went to books for that same reason. This is a perfect example of that kind of subgenre, but it's also a great book about Jane Austen, perfect for Jane Austen July. Uh, it, it, the, one of the things that the, the author consistently underplays in the course of the book, and that is underplayed in that pub sheet, is how good a book this is on Jane Austen, on her fiction, on the ethos behind her fiction, on her characters. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. So it comes out in a week, uh, and uh, is well worth your time. Well worth your time. In addition to which, it will move you. It will genuinely move you. It's, it's, in addition to being uh, so smart, so perceptive, uh, eloquent, really, uh, it's also moving. Uh, wow, fantastic. Okay. Uh, okay, then we have, uh, this is another finished copy. Uh, something that I think we saw on this channel before. This comes out in early June. <laughs> in the early June, June 9th. This is The Vanishing Sky by L. Annette Binder. Uh, which is an intimate, harrowing story about a German family during World War II, inspired by the author's own father's time in the Hitler Youth. The author's father passed when she was just 16. I, I guess that means he died when, he was, when she was just 16. He died, though. He didn't, he didn't pass. He died. <laughs> I've also heard, once upon a time, I heard somebody say, I, I was asking about their uncle or something, or they said, yeah, he's gone to a place. 
And it literally took me 15 minutes in conversation to realize that they were using the stupidest euphemism in the world for he's dead. He died. <laughs> Eventually took me, it took me 15 minutes to realize that the place he went to was six feet in the ground. <sighs> anyway, uh, the two never spoke about his youth, so she imagines the novel as, quote, a letter to my father, a way to share the stories he never got to tell me, end quote. The result is a spellbinding novel about the daring choices we make for country and for family, the irreparable damage of war on the home front, and one's family participation in a dangerous regime. Okay, well, but is it? These are the stories that you never got around to talking about with your father, but they're carefully mimeographed from his experiences. So is this a novel or isn't it? And if I were to read this novel and say it's poorly put together and none of the characters are convincing, they're all poorly drawn, and here I will demonstrate. Uh, the character of the main character's father, I will demonstrate how poorly drawn this character is, how this, the, the novel does not create the character. What are you as an author going to say? Hopefully nothing. <laughs> I hope we've learned that on this channel, that you will say nothing. But if you do say something, what are you going to say, aside from calling for my cancellation? You're if your first response is going to be, well, I can produce the letters. You can't call it unconvincingly drawn because it's all true. Every bit of it is true. Well, then this isn't a novel, and that's no excuse. So I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the, the author didn't write the pub sheet, so I don't, I don't have any idea if all that mention of the father's experiences during World War II is meant to critic-proof the book. I have no idea. Uh, it won't work if it is. <laughs> it won't work. Uh, not this critic, anyway. But uh, I've had the advanced copy of this thing, and even though it's a June release, I haven't got to it. The new releases uh, world here at Steve Donahue Studios has been in disarray for quite some time. <laughs> With so much stuff delayed, so many pub dates moved around, and so many books existing only in electronic format for me. Uh, with me needing to, not that this is a big problem, I know it's a first world problem, but I'm, le I'm needing to learn all kinds of new ways to organize those things and, and, you know, index them for myself, for my own reference, for my own use. So it's been a bit of chaos. There are, I'm sure are quite a few June books that slip through the net that I haven't got to. So it's great to be reminded of this one because it does sound fascinating. Uh, so I will get to that uh, Today, I hope I hope I will get to that today. Uh, let's see, let's see what this next one is. Oh, another finished copy. Uh, great. Oh boy! Oh, fantastic! Okay, this comes out in late July. I think we saw the advanced copy of this. This is by Peter Lake, and it's called Hamlet's Choice: Religion and Resistance in Shakespeare's Revenge tra Tragedies. Hamlet's Choice. Uh, Conspiracies and revolts simmered beneath the surface of Queen Elizabeth's reign as England was riven by tensions created by religious conflict and the prospect of a dynastic crisis and regime change. In this incisive account, Peter Lake reveals how, in Titus Andronicus and Hamlet, Shakespeare worked through a range of Tudor anxieties, including concerns about the nature of justice, resistance, and salvation. In both plays, the princes are faced with successions forged under questionable circumstances, and they each have a choice, whether or not to, be, to resort to political violence. The unfolding action, Lake argues, is best understood in terms of contemporary debates about the legitimacy of resistance and the relationship between religion and politics. I'm not sure that those are the choices faced by Hamlet. <laughs> Well, that's one of the things I love about Hamlet, is that it, you can talk about it endlessly. It's an endless work of literature. But does Hamlet face any political decisions in the course of the play? Doesn't seem to me like he does. Seems to me like a lot of people in the play think that he is. It seems to me that all the decisions that he faces, in terms of the succession, especially if you want to put it in that in those anemic terms, are intensely personal. It seems to me that in the course of the play, Shakespeare, or Hamlet is less concerned about the politics of what he is doing or what he is charged to do or what he isn't doing than anybody else. Even the, the son of a foreign ruler seems more interested in the politics of Denmark than Hamlet does. Uh, so that's fascinating. I don't know. And I, I uh, have lots of good experiences with Peter Lake, so I'm, I'm all for it. I don't see much correlation between the two plays, but that's fantastic. All right, so this gets bumped right to the front of the list. Fantastic. New book on Shakespeare. Hamlet's Choice, about uh, regime change, politic, political upheaval, and resistance. Uh, 
in two Shakespeare plays. Fantastic. Uh, okay, well, this is the author. This author, I, he had another book on this channel, How Shakespeare Put Politics on the Stage, that uh, I really liked and that a lot of you commented on. So this is his next book, Hamlet's Choice. Due out in July, unless that date changes. Uh, so let's see here. And we have one more package and a box, cause, and that's good because I'm pretty much done here. So, uh, so let's... Uh, Let's see what the next this next envelope is, and then we'll move on to the box. Oh, great. Oh, fantastic. Okay. All right, this is by Lindsay Ellis. This is also due next week. And this is a novel called Axiom's End. We've already seen the advanced copy of this. Uh, let's see here. From author and Hugo-nominated video essayist Lindsay Ellis comes an alternate history of first contact adventure set in the early 2000s, pitched as Stranger Things meets Arrival. <laughs> or uh, otherwise it could also be good <laughs> uh, in addition to her own YouTube channel Lindsay Ellis is a YouTuber author, Hugo Award finalist video essayist who creates online content about media, narrative, and film theory Lindsay Ellis is a YouTuber one of our own <laughs> how do you like that? huh I don't think she has 4,000 videos, but her, her, her one or two videos probably have much higher production quality. Uh, fantastic. She's a YouTuber. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Well, anyway, let's get to the book, <laughs> shall we? Because uh, YouTubers can write bad books. This is a proven fact. <laughs> uh, by the fall of 2007... One well-timed leak revealing that the U.S. government might have engaged in first contact has sent the country into turmoil. And it is all Cora Sabino can do to avoid the whole mess. The force driving this controversy is Cora's whistleblower father, and even though she hasn't spoken to him in years, his celebrity has caught the attention of the press, the internet, the paparazzi, and the government, and redirected it to her. <laughs> she neither knows nor cares whether her, father leaks, whether her father's leaks are a hoax and wants nothing to do with him until she learns just how deeply entrenched her family is in the cover-up and that an extraterrestrial presence has been on Earth for decades. To save her own life, she offers her services as an interpreter to a monster, and the monster accepts. Learning the extent to which both she and the public have been lied to, she sets out to gather as much information as she can and finds that the best way for her to find the truth is not as a whistleblower, but as an intermediary. The alien presence has been completely uncommunicative until she convinces one of them that she can act as their interpreter, becoming the first and only human vessel of communication. But in becoming the interpreter, she begins to realize that she has become the voice for a being she cannot ever truly know or understand, and starts to question who she's speaking for. Truth is a human right. What other secrets have been kept from us by the government? In the world of Axion's end, what Cora Sabino discovers will change everything she knows about, everything she thought she knew about the history of our country and could unleash a force more sinister than she ever imagined. Okay, well, I, mean, I seem to remember having the same reaction when I read the uh, description of the advanced copy. I'm totally on board. I, don't, I haven't read this yet, so that, is, that sounds fantastic. And the, uh, the author is a Hugo finalist, a video essayist who creates online content about media, narrative, and film theory. How does this thing begin, I wonder? How does Axiom's End begin? <laughs> With redacted stuff. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Uh, let's see. On the morning of the second meteor, Cora's 1989 Toyota Camry gave up the ghost for good. The car was a manual transmission with a stick shift its previous owner had wrapped in duct tape years ago, a time bomb the color of expired baby food that should have gone off sooner than it did. At $800, she had paid more for it than it was worth, but back then she had been a freshman in college and desperate for a car. In the two years since, she'd grown accustomed to the ever-loudening squealing of the fan belt, but on this morning, after she put her key in the ignition and the engine turned, the squealing turned into a hostile screech, a disheartening thunk, thunk, thunk followed, then a snap, then an angry whirr, all before she could react. But by the time she turned off the ignition, it was clear that the car, her first and only car, was dead forever, and she was already late for work. <laughs> and look what happens in that first paragraph. Look at how much, deceptively, how much happens in that first paragraph. Right? What do we learn about Lindsay in that first paragraph? 
that she's hopeful and also incredibly stubborn. And the first paragraph is entirely consumed with the mysteries of language. The car is talking. The car is saying all sorts of things that need to be interpreted. Well, anyway, I'm on board <laughs> with this book. So, And as usual, with mail halls of any kind, the, the, the mail hall is becoming a TBR. I, I, I mean, one after another thing here is something that I want to read today. <laughs> so, uh, let's, let's finish up. Let's finish up with the box. It's heavy, but it's not slopping around, so it might be one big book and not multiple books. Uh, let's see. Oh, baby, this thing is big. I don't think you want it. I don't think you want this. This is as big as you are. Now, and I don't want you to destroy the box anyway because I might need it to mail stuff out to my lame-ass booktube friends. <laughs> you want to see them? You want to see your friends? Woohoo! There's the baby. Oh, he's a baby. Ooh. She might look a little more dapper to you because we had another World War III clipping session yesterday. Didn't we? You didn't take it well. You were, th <laughs> you were thrashing all over the place. She doesn't get violent. And even the thrashing isn't violent. It's much more... She puts out a paw to the scissors with a look on her face that says, Do you really want to do that? You don't really want to do that. <laughs> Uh, so I take it slow and I do a little bit at a time. No, baby, leave the box alone. I might need the box. And I might point out that the floor is covered in things that you have only bitten once. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's see what the... <gasps> oh, I was beginning to wonder if I wouldn't get this. Oh, boy. Oh, talk about a TBR. Good Lord. Okay, well, we've heard about this book already, but, uh, but now we get to see it. This is the latest in the Yale English Monarch series. This is Henry III uh, by David Carpenter. 1207 to 1258. Incredible. Only nine when he assumed the throne in 1216. No, baby, that's plastic. Baby, please. Only nine when he assumed the throne in 1216. Henry III had to rule within the limits set by the establishment of Magna Carta and the emergence of a parliament... Pacific, conciliatory, and deeply religious, Henry brought many years of peace to England and rebuilt Westminster Abbey in honor of his patron saint, Edward the Confessor. Uh, he poured money into embellishing his palaces and creating a magnificent court, yet his investment in soft power, that's the, the author's term, it's in quotes, uh, did not prevent a great revolution in, in 1258 led by Simon de Montfort, ending his personal rule. Uh, Eminent historian David Carpenter brings to life Henry's character and reign as never before, using source material of unparalleled richness. Carpenter stresses the king's achievement, as well as his failures, while offering a new perspective on the intimate connections between medieval politics and religion. Oh boy. Okay, fantastic. This is the first in a two volume. This is going to be two volumes. So the, this particular volume ends uh, in 1258 when Henry's direct rule of his country ended as well. Uh, and the next one, I presume, will go on. For, and the next one will cover an area of Henry's reign that is undercovered. I mean, this is, this is undercovered. With his king, is just generally undercovered. Fantastic to have this uh, in a physical copy. That is just great. And the, the date on it is today. Yesterday. Something like that. So immediate. So... <laughs> and I have all the other Yale English Monarch series volumes, and I love them. Some of them are better reading than others, but I love them all. And this is a perfect example. Good Lord. My TBR has been completely restructured by this mail hall. So well, there you go. We'll do a Steve Pyle if I'm able. We have Henry III. This is volume one of a two-volume biography that you know, there's a natural split in his reign. And, and this is, covers the time when he had his hands on the actual reins of power. Uh, then we have Axiom's End, I have to confess, made-up story or no made-up story, it is deeply appealing to me. Uh, we have Hamlet's Choice by Peter Lake, an author I'm increasingly liking. Uh, we have The Vanishing Sky, which is sounds interesting. I'm always up for the time period, and also it is a little bit more exigent than some of the others because it's older. So it feels like I should have already gotten to it. So every one of these things has some reason to, to recommend it, not this one. Austin Years doesn't, because I'm already done with Austin Years. I am, I am drafting my review as we speak, so I, I can recommend it uh, enormously, enthusiastically. 
I recommend it. We have all been there. We have all been there with Rachel Cohen. Maybe not with Jane Austen, but we've all been there. We have all gone to books when we needed them for something other than a reading experience. I'd be willing to bet, if not all, I'd be willing to bet that most of us have. And this book is a beautiful meditation on how that works. Uh, then we have Pew by Catherine Lacey. I don't know if the, uh, this is a finished copy, so I'm assuming it's not going to have a dust jacket. Uh, and Trixie and Katya's Guide to Modern Womanhood. Uh, <laughs> I don't have any commentary on Trixie and Katya. And then The Order of the Day in a trade paperback. I strongly recommend it. Your library might have a copy. Uh, I strongly recommend it. If the paperback is out now for $16, then the uh, hardcover might be $1 online somewhere. Uh, one way or another, in terms of digestible history, I strongly recommend it. So there you go. That is our old style mail haul for today. And as tempting as rereading Order of the Day is, uh, quite a few of these things, at least four of them, uh, immediately suggest themselves for my, for my TBR today. It's a goodbye to all the other stuff that was on that TBR. But anyway, I'm, uh, I'm going to wrap this up for now, but I will be back. Thank you, BookTube.